Whole Hog Sports presents the basketball podcast of Mid-America, the premier Arkansas hoops podcast brought to you by Landers Toyota of Northwest Arkansas. With Whole Hog Sports basketball analyst Scotty Bordelon, here's your host, Matt Jones. Well, if you want to know how much excitement there is for Razorback basketball this year, you can't get a ticket. Tickets are already sold out to the Razorbacks game, and we're still two weeks away from the season opener against Mercer. Arkansas will play its first exhibition game on Sunday afternoon at Bud Walton Arena. They're going to take on East Central University. That's a Division II team from Ada, Oklahoma. And then just announced this week, they're also going to play North Texas the following week on Saturday, October 30th, a 4 o'clock tip-off at Bud Walton Arena. That's a Division I versus Division I exhibition game, obviously. Usually you can't do that, but because there's a charitable component, they're going to give a portion of proceeds from merchandise and, and concession sales to the United Way of Northwest Arkansas for COVID relief. NCAA makes an exception and Razorbacks will play a really good Division One opponent. North Texas was in the NCAA tournament a year ago and they've come to Bud Walton Arena the last couple of years and given the Razorbacks some pretty good games. Matt Jones joined by Dudley Dawson of Hogs Illustrated and Scotty Bordelon of WholeHogSports.com. Dudley, this kind of feels like the old days when there was a lot of anticipation for basketball building about this time of year. Yeah, I really go back, I think, to 1996 when there's been this much excitement in the preseason. And certainly we know what Arkansas was coming off of back then, the national championship and uh, the runner-up finish. Uh, I've been very surprised how quickly Eric Musselman has remade the program. He's gotten the fans very excited about things. You could see that uh, Sunday at the red-white game. And, uh, you know, the chance to, to watch this team and being around these guys, I'm, I'm a little excited to see what kind of narratives we have coming from the season as well. Yeah, I think it's a pretty neat deal. I've obviously seen Bud Walton packed, uh, you know, probably 10 times maybe since I've been on this beat. Um, but this is going to be, this is going to be a different animal, I think. And it's pretty fun. I think the only tickets left are, you know, for students and, you know, accommodations made to opposing teams and that kind of thing. It's going to be really fun, and I think the roster that Eric has put together, you know, through recruiting with, with Chance Moore, who I think has got a little bit of a ways to go before he, you know, makes some really significant contributions. But through the transfer portal, man, there's some exciting guys on the team. And then, obviously, the two returning guys in Devo and, and Jalen Williams, you know, there's there's plenty of reason to be excited, and there's a lot of – a lot of call for optimism just because of um, obviously what you saw in the red white game from a few guys and, you know, just kind of the carryover from, from the elite eight run that was, you know, kept pretty unexpected, but um, you know, generated a lot of buzz. It's going to be a fun year. The AP poll came out this week. Arkansas is ranked number 16. It's the first time since 2007, 2008 that the Razorbacks have been ranked in the preseason poll. The SEC poll also came out this week, media poll for SEC, uh, the, the predicted order of finish. Arkansas picked to finish third behind Kentucky uh, and Alabama. Of course, everybody expects those three teams to be really good this year. All of them, you know, ranked pretty highly in the AP poll. Devo Davis was picked to finish second team all SEC. He was the only Arkansas player on that list, Scotty. Were you surprised? Did you think someone got left off? Yeah, it was kind of interesting looking at those – those teams and obviously this is this is you know a panel of of media members you know both who cover the league and nationally it's not the not the coaches the coaches may have a different view uh, or a different say in in these teams but I found it interesting that there were you know several portal additions from other programs in the league who made these all SEC teams and a guy like Stanley Amude who maybe maybe I'm higher on him than some other people but you know he's a guy he finished top 10 in the country in scoring last year and I think he's going to be kind of a focal point I don't know if you want to call him like a cornerstone of your team I think that's more of a Jalen Williams or, or Devo type type label but I think a lot of the offense that Arkansas is going to run is going to flow through him and I think he's got a chance to be like a bona fide star for this team and to see him be left off that that was a little bit I don't know. I kind of raised an eyebrow at that. Um, but I mean, it's 
I think Mike Neighbors likes to say like the preseason polls mean something and they also mean nothing at all. And I think these kind of these preseason all SEC teams are kind of the same way. It's just it's just kind of prognosticating, like just predicting um, with not really just a whole lot to go on. But I think by the end of the year, Arkansas is probably going to have multiple guys on those teams. Going back to when I worked for uh, Coach Sutton and Coach Richardson as a manager, they uh, they always enjoyed these polls and being slighted because they were able to put chips on the shoulders of guys uh, and the team as well. And I think that's going to be a little case here, even though they're getting a lot of respect, uh, you know, nationally and, and in the SEC in terms of their overall team. I think individuals will be able to feel slighted, and, and J.D. Note being one, I think he's going to have a big year, too. I agree with uh, Scotty about Stanley. I, I'm very impressed with the, everything he brings to the table. I do think there are some college basketball writers who maybe don't pay as much attention to different things, uh, especially the transfer portal, than, than a lot of others. Uh, I'm interested, to, Scotty said, to see what the uh, the coaches bring out as well. But I, I do, uh, you know, I go back to, to – those days and think that's probably good for a basketball team to to have the, the us against the world mentality it certainly brought the basketball program the uh, you know most notoriety and most success it's had back here during the day I think it's kind of interesting too that Devo lands on the second team and then a lot of people in his circle are like why is he not on the first team and so even though Devo made those two teams you know there might be a little bit of a chip on his shoulder too just um, feeling like he was worthy of a, a first team nod after the year that he had. Can you imagine this is a guy who barely played, you know, the first part of the season and then really came on and certainly did a lot. We had him out at a players forum we had not too long ago. He's fired up and ready to go into the season. Obviously, it looked like he was shooting the ball from three pointers a little bit better the other day. So I think he's primed to have a big role. And I think he's brimming with confidence. And I don't know that that was the the case, uh, you know, mid part of last year. Yeah, his his the form on his shot and just the lift that he gets and his left elbow is more, you know, more textbook, I think, than than it was last year. But you, you know, you want to see him shoot the ball a little bit better from the perimeter. But he cannot at all get away from from what made him him last year. He might not have been playing confident at, at some point last year, but by the time the NCAA tournament rolled around, I thought he looked like uh, the the most confident player on the Razorbacks team. I want to go back to selling season tickets for a minute, uh, Scotty. You alluded to this that. Not all of the season tickets have been sold, but but what's happened is that, or I should say not all the seats in the building have been sold, but what's happened is that they have capped, basically they can't sell any more season tickets because you have to keep so many for students, you have to keep so many uh, for band members, you've got the media space, you've got to keep so many for opposing teams due to SEC rules. So they sold about 15,400 season tickets. That's the first time since the 2002-03 season that Arkansas has sold out of tickets in the preseason. Before that, it was commonplace uh, for 10 years at Bud Walton Arena, for several years before that at Barnhill Arena. For 26 straight years, Dudley, they sold every ticket in that building. I can remember in the mid-90s, there was like a, a waiting list and a turnback program, and I think it was like 10,000 or more people long. This was the hottest ticket in town, and uh, you know it's starting to kind of become that way again. Yeah, I was going to bring up that waiting list. I think a lot of uh, maybe younger Arkansas fans would not even realize that there was such a demand for tickets to a sporting event like that back in the day. But it was the show back in the day. Everybody wanted tickets. Uh, back then, they were pretty reasonably priced as well, uh, you know, for, for the entertainment you were getting. And uh, certainly the streaming services and all that hadn't made their, their rivals uh, at that point. So, you know, again, the excitement of, of what they did last season, I think some of the excitement of the recruiting uh, that they've been successful in the last couple of years uh, has played into that. And then I think we would be remiss if we didn't say the uh, the, the showman, uh, the head coach, Eric Musselman, has done all he could can not only to, to get uh, people excited about his program, but excited about other programs around here. He uh, He really takes to that social media really well. I liked Mike Anderson a lot, but Mike did not sell his program anywhere near the level that, that Musselman has come in and done. And, uh, you know, I'm not even sure Nolan sold the program as well as he did. Nolan sold the program by, by results on the floor, but in terms of somebody getting out and, you know, selling tickets like this, uh, 
your, your recollection of Eddie Sutton's a lot better than mine, but it reminds me maybe a little bit of what Eddie Sutton did in the seventies, based on what I've read. Obviously I wasn't around for that. You know, what it really reminds me of though, is, is uh, what Gary Blair did for the women uh, whenever he was the head coach here. And you see it right now with Mike neighbors. I say that neighbors is Gary Blair 2.0. If he can get 30 eyeballs in front of him and, and be able to speak to a crowd, he's going to do it. And, you know, Musselman, it's, it's not necessarily that face-to-face -face interaction during the era of COVID, but man, what he's done through social media, Scotty, has just been incredible. And, and I think that that plays a role in what you're seeing right now with the, the interest and, and the demand for tickets within this basketball program. Yeah. I mean, Arkansas fans feel like they're just, you know, you pick up your phone and you can just interact with them that quickly and that easily. And, you know, maybe Arkansas coaches in the past have, you know, maybe not been as, I don't know, social media friendly or um, like to use it at, that much. Um, but that's just, it's such a big part of Eric just kind of reaching out to this, this fan base and trying to get them on board. And I think that they really are. And we'll see that, you know, we've seen that obviously with this, with the people buying, buying up the season tickets like they did. And I think you're going to see a, a response from, from the crowd, you know, just as a kind of a, a you're just kind of building on last year and the excitement that that team generated It's a new team, but you brought in, you know, a lot of talented guys and you've got a pretty good home schedule too that I think fans are going to be really excited about. You know, Mercer might not be the biggest name out there, but that's not a pushover program. I mean, you're not even playing pushover programs in your in your exhibition. So that's, I mean, that's going to bring people out too. And you've got a pretty good home schedule, you know, especially, you know, maybe later in the year. I think you got Kentucky, Tennessee, Mississippi State. I think Mississippi State's a kind of an underrated team in terms of where they were project, projected to finish in the in the SEC. They brought in some pretty good players from the transfer portal too. And Ben Howland is always going to give you a chance to, to be a good team. Um, so I think you're going to see a, I think you're going to see a big response from fans who have been kind of aching for high quality, high caliber basketball for a long time. And I think they feel like they finally got it and they're, they're going to come out in droves. Yeah. I think there's been a revival on the court and now there's going to be a revival in the stands. People not being able to go to the games is uh, another factor. I think that's, that's worked in there. People want to get out of their house and go do things. Uh, sometimes, you know, you can get uh, quite the experience at home with the, the games, you know, all being on TV uh, or most of them, I should say, uh, being on TV. But I think there's a, a thirst for people wanting to get out. Uh, be in that spirit. And, and while the football's early season captured some of that with Texas, uh, you know, I think that uh, there are a lot of basketball fans and there is a, there is a, certainly a segment of the, the population that is strictly basketball fans. There's a, a segment of the population that's strictly baseball fans, uh, same way with football uh, in, in this day and age. But I think that uh, the basketball audience is craving being back in there and uh, at least getting to a modicum of what it used to be back in the day. One thing I think that we need to keep an eye on is just how home court advantages like really play a role this year. And it's not in, in Arkansas. I think, you know, with the, the passion and the, the, kind of the rabid nature of the fans sometimes when basketball's rolling, like that can make like a huge difference in a game. And that, that alone can maybe turn the tide in a game. And, you know, these players last year played in a lot of largely empty buildings. And so it's kind of like football where, you know, you finally play in front of a big crowd. You almost got to learn again how to play in a big crowd. And I think some of these visiting teams can, are going to find out that, um, that the release from these fans is going to be pretty intimidating for some of these opposing teams. And, you know, where Arkansas may have had, you know, maybe a six or eight point advantage simply playing at home, that could be bigger this year. Um, and that, that may be the case, you know, kind of across the board with, you know, fans being really eager to get back into, into arenas and whatnot. But I think Arkansas's home court advantage this year has got a, got a chance to be you know pretty serious. Arkansas 30 and five since they named the at home since they renamed the court Nolan Richardson court. So, uh, and that was without sellout crowds and stuff. So it could be even uh, more intimidating, obviously, once they get the place packed in there and you have a team that uh, certainly is going to be able to score a lot of points. It looks like we'll see how they 
do defensively as they mesh together. But uh, again, it's just an atmosphere I think a lot of people are looking forward to. Even those of us who, who go and cover the games and uh, you know are stationed up there in the middle of the stands behind the band. I saw that thirty and Dudley. I saw that thirty and five stat, and I thought, you know, it's not like they were bad before they named the court after Richardson. I mean, Mike Anderson was one twenty two and twenty three at home. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, but they love to you know they love to trot out details and stuff, and I think that's one of the things that uh, really, to be honest, uh, uh, you know, that coming aboard and all that happening uh, was one of the things during the you know one of the final things during the the uh, uh, situation there that I think has kind of brought everybody together and, and uh, you know, not only from uh, current Razorbacks, uh, fans, players, but the past. You know, when they played the red white game at Barnhill, I, I relinked a story that I did last year, the, the master of Barnhill story that I had written about Eddie Sutton and the, uh, the atmosphere that he had created at Barnhill when he was 120 and eight as Arkansas's uh, coach, at least at home. And that doesn't even count the games that they had at Barton Coliseum and uh, the Pine Bluff Convention Center, which is where they had to go play a lot of their big name opponents because Kansas and North Carolina and those types, they wouldn't come to Fayetteville. They said Barnhill was too intimidating. But I was looking through that, and and in that story, I had uh, the home record for every arena they've ever played at. It's kind of interesting. Probably not next year, but the year after, they will win their 1,000th game at home. And so that's something to kind of to, to keep an eye out on. I think they're at like 956 right now. Mentioned that Eric Musselman doesn't do a lot of public speaking. He is going to speak to the Hugs Illustrated Sports Club, and we want to give you a little bit of detail about that. It's going to be next Wednesday, October 27th. Uh, come listen to Eric Musselman. Uh, you'll get a great meal. You'll be out of there by about 1 o'clock. Doors open at 1140 a.m. The program begins at noon. It's going to be at Mermaids on College Avenue in Fayetteville. If you want more information on that about tickets, visit us at nwadealpiggy.com. That's nwadealpiggy.com. And you can learn more about Eric Musselman at the Hogs Illustrated Sports Club. The exhibition season, as we said, begins on Sunday afternoon. East Central University comes to Bud Walton Arena. That is where Chris Crutchfield, the former Arkansas assistant, went and coached last season. And now, Scotty, they've got another former uh, Arkansas staff member there, a former graduate assistant that's, that's coaching East Central. Yeah, I would have to imagine that that's why this game was put together. Also, you want to, you know, kind of your, your first – you no know, real game action to be against a team where you can, you know, be working out the kinks and probably still get out of there with a pretty comfortable win. Uh, but Max Pendery was a, a graduate assistant on Eric's staff during his first season. Uh, pretty cool that, you know, a graduate assistant that quickly got a head division two job um, as quickly as he did. That's, that's a pretty neat deal. And it's kind of a, I know Arkansas is obviously not going to East Central, but uh, it's going to be a pretty neat deal for Jackson Robinson too, because that's you know where he where he grew up. East Central's in Ada, Oklahoma. Um, I'm really excited about that second one against North Texas. Obviously, it's D1 against D1 for a good cause and all that, but it's going to be good basketball. I mean, Grant McCaslin at North Texas is a guy that I thought Arkansas might go after when they were looking for a replacement for Mike Anderson. Um, he's maybe one of the sharp dressed coaches. <laughs> In, in college basketball too, which is, which is, is cool. Um, but he's, he's always got a good roster. He's pretty consistently put that team in the NCAA tournament. And there's a local connection too, with uh, Tyler Perry, who played at, at Springdale Harbor coming back, that kid can hoop. And he won a junior college national championship at Coffeyville. And he tweeted the other day uh, when the game was announced that, you know, Bud Walton Arena was kind of like the Madison Square Garden for him growing up. So that's going to, going to be a cool deal. It's going to be good basketball and um, I mean, just more reason to come out, man. There's going to be, especially that second game, it's going to be uh, pretty good basketball to, to come see. Yeah, I'm excited about it too. I also got a chance to watch Tyler play a lot in high school. Uh, and, uh, you know, speaking of that, the not only does obviously the Arkansas football team taking on UAPB, in uh, football this week in Little Rock, but uh, basketball is playing plenty of these uh, in-state schools as well. I know some people don't get too excited about that. I do from having lived on the other side of the state and having gone to a lot of different sporting events, uh, a lot of different colleges over the year. I'm, I'm excited to see these teams, and I know these teams are excited to, to come in here, including 
uh, when Daryl Walker uh, bringing his team in and had a chance to talk with the Kamani Johnson, the former ULR, uh, our Arkansas Little Rock, Little Rock, whatever they're going by now, uh, the about that game, and he's he's excited about it is is a lot of people will and he's uh, he's really excited about what we were talking about earlier the opportunity to play a lot of fans a big crowd for for arkansas little rock back in the day uh he mentioned was you know four four to six thousand and so he is excited about that and, and i'm sure a lot of people are as well i was talking to mike neighbors this week and and his women's team are going to or is going to play all four in-state teams he said that in 2019 the day that he got the message from Hunter Urechek that you can now schedule anybody from the state of Arkansas, he said he sent a message to every coach around the state saying that, that he wanted to, to schedule them. And so they're going to play UALR, UCA, UAPB, and Arkansas State at Arkansas State uh, this year. That's the first game in a, a four-game home-and-home for those teams. You mentioned Arkansas is going to play. Uh, the men are going to play UCA on December 1st at Bud Walton Arena. They're going to play UALR on December the 4th. Remember, UALR came to Fayetteville two years ago on the day that they named the Nolan Richardson court uh, for an exhibition game. And at the time it was kind of played off as, well, you know, we want to have a big opponent. Uh, this is, you know, the first time we're going to be able to play this in-state game. Uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, we, we want to kind of blow this out of the water for it being Nolan Richardson's day, but I'm starting to get the sense guys that Eric Musselman wants to play a division one team in the preseason because there wasn't, an exhibition season last year because of COVID. And now in the two preseasons that he has been able to play a game, they played UALR, a team from the Sun Belt. They're going to play North Texas, a team from the Conference USA. Scotty, I just get the sense that he wants to see his team take on a team that's a little bit more their own size before they play a game that really matters. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And he is not about the secret scrimmages really either. Um, and, I, you know, I think it's, especially in the preseason, a lot of, these games are just about evaluation and what are you going to be able to tell about the progress and growth that you're hoping to see from Jalen Williams playing like a no name team. Like you're just, you're not going to be able to find out much about that or your guard play. You're looking for separation um, or some guys who you think can fill these potential roles, maybe in a starting lineup or, you know, maybe in your eight or nine man rotation, you're not going to be able to tell much about, those guys and, you know, how they're developing, coming along, um, picking up the offense and, you know, you know, kind of the intricacies of, of the defense that they want to play, playing these lower level teams, because, I mean, you're, you're not going to have to put, you know, you're not going to have to put your best foot forward to have success against some of these teams. That's just the way it is. But you play a, a team like North Texas, you're going to have to bring it as, I mean, that's a, that's a mid-major program i would say that you know they can they can put they can put the they can put some fear in you you know if you don't bring your a game and so i, th I think a lot of this is just about evaluation um and you want to you want to have some some good tape and not some some throwaway film uh, and you know minutes to to look at you know prior to the season starting i think secret scrimmages are about the stupidest thing i've ever heard of right up there with secret uh commitments and recruiting and all that but it does you no good to practice against somebody without uh you know without a game-like situation uh and you know i always thought that secret scrimmages were for coaches who were more worried about the uh, public facade of their team than it was about them getting better. I mean, I, I like the fact that they're playing North Texas. I like the fact that, uh, you know, there's a, 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 you know, a component there that will help people out. I just, uh, I just, again, I just want to reiterate, I think secret scrimmages are the, one of the stupidest things I've ever heard of. One more note on exhibitions. Uh, mentioned the game times. East Central at three o'clock uh, this Sunday, North Texas at four o'clock next Saturday, October 30th. For the East Central game, there is not going to be any TV or online stream or radio broadcast for that game. So the only way you can watch that game is to get in to Bud Walton Arena and the tickets have been sold. Those are sold as part of the season ticket packages. So you're going to have to buy them on the secondary market. No determination has been made yet on whether they'll have TV or radio for North Texas. Uh, the sense that I get is that there might be a radio broadcast for that game. They've done radio uh, for one exhibition game per preseason. So again, no radio, TV, or online for East Central this weekend to be determined for the North Texas games next week. And tickets are sold out for 
both of those games. The Basketball Podcast of Mid-America is presented by Landers Toyota of Northwest Arkansas. Stop by and see them at their location on Metro Parkway and Rogers, or visit them online at LandersToyotaNWA.com. For all your automotive needs, shop Landers Toyota NWA in Rogers, where we guarantee you the best buying experience and best service after the sale in Arkansas. Landers Toyota NWA in Rogers. The last time we had a basketball podcast of Mid-America, we spent a lot of time talking about Nick Smith's commitment to the Razorbacks. At that time, he was the first five-star player to commit to Arkansas in nine years since Bobby Portis had done so in the class of 2013. They didn't have to wait very long for their second five-star commit. Dudley Jordan Walsh, who plays at a prep school in Branson, committed to the Razorbacks last week. That gives them two five-stars now in this class, and it's, it's a really bona fide star-studded class in the class of 2022 that's right up there with the likes of Duke and Kentucky and the other Blue Bloods. Yeah, it's it's unreal. I mean, uh, to get two top 10 players, uh, legitimate top 10 players, uh, only Duke has two of the other top 10. Uh, there are a few that obviously that have one, including, including Kentucky and North Carolina. But it is, a, it is a phenomenal recruiting class, not only at the top, but you have five top 100 uh, legitimate kids in the class. Four of them were here Sunday for the red-white game. They all seem very comfortable with each other. Uh, they all seem excited about where the program's at right now, where it's headed. Uh, you know, you may have a couple who are one and done. We'll see how it plays itself out. But I think that uh, this recruiting has set them up for, uh, you know, for future success down the line, as has these last two years. And I, I would tell to uh, Jordan, uh, who's, who's a great young man, uh, that uh, I was very excited that the opportunity to cover him was going to be a, you know, a little over an hour trip to Ranson instead of a, uh, a flight to California uh, Sports Academy, which is where he was going to play, even though he's from DeSoto, Texas for the year, but just a great class and, and uh, another reason for Razorback fans to be excited. And, and we know they are because that's all the questions I get. Walsh is six foot seven, weighs 190 pounds. He's listed as a small forward. We mentioned he plays at Link Academy in Branson, grew up in Cedar Hill, Texas. Dudley, you've seen him play. How would you describe his game? Well, uh, for old time uh, fans, I would describe him as a uh, William Mills type, uh, somebody who's very strong, incredible athleticism, uh, will jump out of the gym. I think it's 42 inch vertical, uh, but also as a guy who takes pride in his defense. So he's playing. 40 minutes or 32 or, uh, you know, whatever with, uh, you know, a full le length of intensity all, all the time. Uh, as for, you know, c former Razorbacks that are more current, I think Michael Qualls is a, uh, is certainly, uh, you know, somebody that you can throw him in there, but his shot is much better. And he is, uh, you know, he's listed as a small forward. I think he's, you know, he can play combo forward, you know, at power forward as well. Uh, and in Coach Musta's positionless basketball, he and the other ones that are coming in here, uh, you know, are going to be able to interchange. And I think that's going to be very impressive. One of the other things that was I thought was uh, so, uh, you know, a little bit different was uh, of the four up there that uh, Darian Ford is now a full six foot five. Uh, you know, I think when I first started covering him a couple of years ago, he might have been 6'2", 6 6'3". 6 uh, he apparently has been hitting the weights uh, really well and really looks like an NFL wide receiver as much as he does uh, a college uh, basketball player. But, uh, you know, they're going to be, you know, that group, as long as they keep their head on, keep working, are really going to be exciting to watch in the future. You mentioned four of the commits were at the red-white game. Tell me if I'm wrong. It was Joseph Pinion, Darian Ford, Nick Smith, and Jordan Walsh there to watch the Razorbacks on Sunday at Barnhill Arena. Right. Barry Dunning Jr., the, uh, the Alabama Gatorade Player of the Year last year, was not able to make it. He'll be here during the game this season, but that's the five of them. Scotty, at the red-white game, you wrote a lot of observations on our site at wholehogsports.com. What were some of the biggest ones, though, that you took out of that? Yeah, I think the the first one that jumped out to me is that I think I really do think Stanley Mude is going to be a terrific player for Arkansas. Uh, I say Dudley Small, and I think he knows that I've got a I've got a crush on Stanley's game, similar to the one that I had on on Justin Smith's play last year. Just kind of the way that he went about um, his business, but Stanley can do a little bit of everything, man. Like he he kind of quietly scored sixteen points. 
he kind of quietly grabbed 11 rebounds and I didn't realize it until after the game, but he had five assists too. And so that's a, that's a pretty well-rounded dude uh, that Arkansas brought in. And I think, you know, Stanley's ability to score and rebound alone makes him an all SEC caliber player, which is why I was a little bit surprised that he wasn't on those preseason teams. But I think what can turn him into a star in this, in this league and maybe nationally too is that vision. And, you know, he was one of the more high usage guys in the country at South Dakota, you know, because he, he really had to be on, on that team. But last year he had a career high assist rate, which I think that's, that's pretty encouraging too. So he's, he's not a black hole when he gets the ball. And I think, you know, when his, you know, if he can improve his shot selection and, and decision-making um, and, you know, kind of determine better what's a good shot for him and what's not, um, the offense will flow through him more. And I think you'll see those assists kind of kind of rise too. Um, so he's going to be great. And then I think Jackson Robinson stood out to me too. He was kind of he kind of flew under the radar because you know he was the youngest guy in that transfer portal hall, and he's supposed to be a true freshman right now. And so he's got a lot of room to grow. But I've been really encouraged by you know his ability to shoot. And for a young guy, he's really really good about he's really low maintenance, which is great. And he's not, he's going to be a guy that his play, you know, his, his effort level, his energy is not going to be dictated on the number of looks that he gets. And I think he's going to be awesome for Arkansas. Um, going to be a great compliment for the the three guards that they have, because he's, like I said, low maintenance and he, in transition, I think he finds open spaces on the floor really well and knockdown shooter. And I think he's got some some room to grow defensively, but um, I think if they throw him in the lineup, he's going to be a good player. He's a guy that's already um, already risen in uh, in Arkansas's rotation to this point. Yeah, one thing that I noticed during the ball game, uh, certainly they all have the ability to score, but I was impressed with how they would make the extra pass, and that's something you really don't see very often uh, early on in in practices and scrimmages and stuff like that. Uh, you know, them willing to share the ball because a lot of these guys were the guy at different places, but uh, they made the extra pass. And uh, I noticed Jackson Robinson as well. His spacing is very good. And I think that's something they'll continue to work on. But I think that's, you know, there were times, I think, when uh, uh, obviously when uh, Coach Musselman first got here, that Arkansas had about two scoring options. And if they didn't score, then, you know, it was going to be in trouble. I think they've got legitimately uh, seven, eight that can go, go in double figures if given the opportunity to do so. You know, the thing that stood out to me, we talk about how they are recruiting these big time players and about Musselman and Keith Smart and all these guys on staff, Ronnie Brewer, who have NBA experience. It felt like I was watching an NBA game, the music going while they were playing, uh, you know, just kind of the the, the, uh, the flow of the game. And you, you want to sell your program as being something, you know, Arkansas really wants to sell its program as a pathway to the NBA. Scotty, I don't think they could have had any better uh, you know, showcase for that than, than what they showed in Barnhill. Yeah, that, that's, that's right. Like, I mean, I was trying to do updates, you know, despite the, the lack of internet connection in, in Barnhill the other day. And it was just like, it's kind of hard to get my thoughts together just because music was playing the whole time. And I kind of sound very, very old saying that, but it was, it did feel like kind of a, an NBA atmosphere. I thought you were going to say what stood out was the two flop warnings that the officials handed out to a couple of different players. Um, that was kind of odd to me, um, kind of a game-like situation, which is what you want in, a, in an inner squad scrimmage. Um, but yeah, I think there's, it definitely felt like an NBA atmosphere. And I definitely think that there are some, some NBA caliber guys on this roster. I took great pride in that. Uh, thinking that was probably one of the few people on press row, especially my age, being 58, that knew who Post Malone was during the entertainment portion before they started the game. But uh, you sounded a lot like Nate Allen, uh, our, our good friend and uh, lovable crotchety old Nate Allen, who was not a big fan of the music uh, uh, and just wanted them to play ball. <laughs> yeah, one other thing that I liked was I think Trey Wade, even though he wasn't on the floor during the game he i think that that dude is an entertainer and i think he's going to bring some you know he's going to bring 
moments of levity, you know, that you're going to need throughout the season, going to keep things light. Uh, it was good to see him on the floor pregame, getting a workout in too, because he's, you know, dealing with the, uh, an injury to a tendon in his knee, but he's got that stabilizer brace off. Um, and he's, I think he's slowly working his way back and he's going to be a, a big piece to, to this team too, as a, you know, as a guy that can knock down mid-range shots and, you know, be a range rebounder who can, you know, grab, grab loose balls, you know, out of, um, you know, maybe outside of, um, you know, his wingspan. Be sure to come over to wholehogsports.com this weekend for more on Razorback basketball. Scotty's already written a lot of preseason content there that you can read. Can't watch the game. You can't listen to it on Sunday unless you're there, but we'll have reporters there at Bud Walton Arena and we'll give you a full report after the Razorbacks take on East Central University at 3 o'clock Sunday. We'll be back with another basketball podcast of Mid-America later this month. We'll talk about the exhibition games, and we'll take a look forward to the regular season. Regular season begins in less than three weeks. The Razorbacks will take on Mercer on November the 9th at Bud Walton Arena. For Dudley Dawson and Scotty Bordelon, I'm Matt Jones. We appreciate you joining us, and we hope to see you soon at wholehogsports.com. The preceding has been a production of wholehogsports.com. Look for our latest podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast store. And visit us anytime at wholehogsports.com for the latest news and commentary.